Nowhere was the combination of nationalism and status more prevalent than in the case of the British Empire. Catherine Tidrick explained how the English ruling class believed that character would suffice to rule the empire and that force was usually not necessary. The claim of the English aristocrats to leadership ordained by God was inextricably linked with hierarchy, duty, obedience, and religion, all pre-modern cultural traits. Men like Cecil Rhodes thought the English race was the best in the world and lesser peoples deserved to be ruled by them. But the British Empire was done on the cheap, hence the rationale for character over brute force. The tactic of indirect rule exalted the man on the spot, who could rule through charisma rather than by training, playing off local tribal leaders against each other. T. E. Lawrence believed he controlled Arabs without their knowing it. From the age of eight, English ruling class boys went off to public school like Eton, where they were denied family love, raised in savage brutality, and stimulated to confirm class attitudes that rich people had a right to rule everyone else. Britain never needed Adolf Hitler because these schools manufactured thousands of Führers. Both the left and the right have highlighted the economic motive of imperialism. The classic liberal economist before 1914 thought capitalism needed to exploit foreign markets by force if necessary. Formal rule of colonies was not needed if free trade was allowed. The spread of civilization and trade was a white man's responsibility. J. A. Hobson thought a congeries of interests, military, missionaries, manufacturers, and bankers, formed in order to impose Western colonial subjugation on foreigners, but the taproot of imperialism was the influence of finance capitalists. The British upper class was hoarding wealth in the 19th century and needed a place to dump capital, colonies being the logical choice. But it starved the home country of investment, impoverishing the workers, a parasitic drain on the national treasury. Robinson and Gallagher, in their imperialism of free trade, suggested there was continuity in, in imperialism throughout the 19th century, but finance men played only a small role. In their view, imperialism was the direct political aspect of integrating new regions into the expanding British worldwide economy. Direct rule was necessary in regions where economic opportunity or strategic interest were great, but where security was minuscule. Indirect, informal control through free trade was the preferred method of imperialism. Both formal and informal empires were functions of the extending pattern of overseas trade, investment, migration, and culture. Informal rule, or outright political possession, depended in large part on the degree of collaboration available from the natives of any particular region. The process of expansion reached its most valuable targets long before the scramble for Africa in the last quarter of the 19th century. Imperialism was made possible only through the collaborative efforts of indigenous peoples, therefore more a function of African or Asian local politics than of European economic or geopolitical interests. When the imperial powers ran out of collaborators, they had to leave. So many African leaders petitioned Europe for help that it looked like a scramble for protection. In Africa and the Victorians by Robinson and Gallagher, they buttressed theory with empirical evidence. British diplomats and merchants worked together to spread the rule of free trade from Buenos Aires to Istanbul, from the Niger to the Yangtze. Power was extended through cajolery, prestige, threats, or occasional bombardment. All regions were drawn into the empire of informal sway. The reason for British colonies in Africa was not for the sake of empire building, but for the strategic necessity of protecting sea routes to India. When security by informal influence broke down, the British moved in militarily. The trigger mechanism for such moves was nationalism. 
nationalist rebellion in Egypt in 1882 prompted a British takeover and caused a scramble for colonies in Africa by the other great powers of Europe. In the days of Canning and Palmerston, the British had been able to exert imperial prestige through free trade without competition. What changed in the last quarter of the 19th century was British commercial and industrial supremacy was challenged by other powers in Europe like France and Germany. The British were forced to protect what they already owned by the method of imperial expansion. Their African empire was the product of fear, a fear of losing an early lead. If geography is important to empire building, then frontiers are critical to its definition. Empires require stable borders, and this results in a zone of chaos at the edge. Imperialists became obsessed with securing recently pacified frontiers, moving them forward incessantly. The tyranny of distance and the high cost of sustaining logistics and transport over wide areas leads to the axiom, power decays with distance. The British in 19th century Afghanistan come to mind as an example, protecting India by conquering more and more distant land. Still, there are those who insist British imperialism was about finance and not strategic interests. Kane and Hopkins and their British imperialism thought the cause of imperialism was gentlemanly capitalism of aristocrats and London bankers. It was a metropolitan phenomena with 300 years of continuity from 1688 to the 21st century. The informal empire of free trade in British manufacturers did not exist and the periphery was a sideshow. The greatest expansion of London finance into the foreign market took place from 1850 to 1914, and after World War I had to compete on worsening terms with other centers of finance such as Japan, Germany, and the United States. Kane and Hopkins said imperialism was a collaborative process and required integration of world economics with that of Britain in an early example of globalization. But they also acknowledge that when the terms of credit from the city bankers involved loss of sovereignty to other nations, British expansion became imperialism. Theirs is a story of city bankers and loafing aristocrats pursuing the peaceful art of lending money. Yet, there is one area in which Kane and Hopkins and Robinson and Gallagher agree. They all stress the actions of economically motivated actors and do not rely on Marxian structure to explain imperialism. This is your empire historian, Frank H. Wallace, Ph.D. Thank you for listening and thinking.